of you may be wondering why a humanities guy is at the podium talking at a hackathon conference. Does this sort of thing happen often? Yes or no? Maybe. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. Before I get into my stuff with the slides and all the rest of it, I have a question for you. Do you know or have you decided why you are here? I mean, aside from, you know, the deliver of t-shirts. Any volunteers to answer this question? Why are you here? Yes. To make new connections. New connections. Okay. That's in the realm of abstract. What does that mean to make connections? Like meet people? or connect to technological discourses. Meet new people. Meet new people. And collaborate? Mm -hmm. For what purpose? To what end? For a new learning, learning opportunity. New opportunities. To what end? Are you interested in making this place, I'm talking about planet Earth, a better place? than it is already? The answer to that, from my trusted point of view, is a resounding yes. That's what I want to talk to you about. What to do about technology in the context of the human condition at large. So, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for changing the slides for me. So, Let's talk ontologically. Now, what do I mean by ontological perspective? Just think of on ontology as the environment in which you are born, raised, develop consciousness in, in all the rest of it about your lives. We live in a very peculiar age. There's so much excitement about developing technologies, particularly high tech, Silicon Valley, this area where we live, the kind of work that you're excited about and you're doing, and it's innovation, almost on a daily basis, if not millisecond basis and so on. So all kinds of excitement happening, right? We are wired 24-7. We live our lives through virtual means as well as the physical means, but there is a difference between, say, my generation, which I'm a little bit older than you guys, and your generation <laughs> in terms of our relationship to reality. I can see the next slide. Would be nice. Right. Okay. You guys, all of you in this room, are classified as what? Digital natives, that's what you are. You were born into the digital age. When I was a kid, when I was in college, when I was, say, freshman, sophomore year in college, I had to type my papers to turn in to the professors, and you know, uh, that was the extent of our advanced technology, college work and everything. There was no such thing as email, social media, and texting, and all the rest of it. All the things that you were born into. The way in which you see the world. Now, my generation, the digital immigrants, sometimes we have certain advantages over you guys, and in other times, you all have advantages over us. And let me just point out one of those advantages, just to point out why I've chosen this slide that shows there is a gap between the two generations. We, the digital immigrants, have access to the previous reality, and in some ways we live our lives through that access. We're reading the actual newspaper, right? The physical newspaper is this large, and everything, all the content is on the pages, is important to us, but we know how to do it. Even if it's not important to us, we know how to do it. For you, 
reading the news to Reddit or some other aggregate platform or somewhere on your phone, on the fly, in the air, while you drive, while you walk, while you do your homework, while you eat and all that stuff. It's just natural, right? And you get it. But for us, it's a foreign concept that we can learn. So our advantage is that we know the old system, let's call it old media, and we are learning the new media. So you are in a bit of a disadvantage of not having access to the old reality. But you can learn about it. And that's why someone like me infiltrates your conferences and comes and talks about this stuff. That's why you take general education courses in college and get involved with the intersection of philosophy, psychology, history, fine arts, performance arts, art history, all of that with STEM. Right? It may not seem like a natural marriage, but it is. So your advantage over us is that you can conceive a reality, virtual and physical, all at once. Something that I'm trying to understand. I've been studying this stuff for many years. I write articles and books about it, and I'm still trying to learn what it means to perceive reality through the virtual means and the physical means in the same plane, where they are connected, where they're part of the same sphere of existence. Right? Well, one could easily argue that at the end of the day, the kind of reality we experience is just a perception of the deeper reality that does exist. And we're trying to penetrate to the surface and get at it at some point. All right. Those who study physics, those who are looking at quantum physics and, and all of that, uh, have theories about penetrating to the surface and getting at that reality that it's timeless, it's spaceless, and all of that. But that could be the subject for another talk. Point being that there is a gap, and we must at least from my perspective, we must close the gap, or at the very least, narrow the gap, so we can work together to make this place a better place. And by place, again, let me emphasize, I'm talking about the planet Earth, human societies, animal societies, the plants, the atmosphere, the entire ecosystem in which we are members. Next slide, please. Now, we know it's a fact. Technology is evolving faster than the speed of light sometimes. I'm talking to you today, you're doing development work here, your teams, various teams are going to come up with new, innovative, exciting stuff. And it's going to happen in a matter of three days, right? But in the process, as this evolution takes place, to what extent do we think about ethics, the implications of the kind of work we do with these technologies? Do you know what I mean by ethics? You do? I'm seeing some nodding heads. Somebody give me a one sentence definition of ethics. Quickly. I'm not grading you on this. Moral code. All right, I like the code language in that. Yes, you're not wrong, right? What is ethics? I'll give you a quick definition. This gentleman here said moral codes, meaning that doing the right or wrong, right? Knowing the difference between right and wrong and doing it right, right? Everyday activity. Everyday activity that is based on facts and values. So this is what we're talking about. Values is the moral code. The moral code gives you the values, and then the facts are what happens on the street, what happens in your computers, 
what you're working on. What are the implications of the apps you're making? Are they going to help humanity? Let's say a team here you know, decides to put an app together to locate homeless shelters in the Bay Area. So people who are homeless or people who work to help the homeless can quickly spot homeless shelters with spaces, vacancies, they can put homeless people in there, all right? There may be zero money in that, right? You don't make any money from developing that app. But the reward that you get from it, the altruism that is involved in it, is a fantastic reward based on the moral code that you pointed out. That's what I mean by ethics in technology. Thinking about doing it right, doing the right thing. And what are the implications of what you're developing? The bigger picture, right? Next slide, please. Okay, so, here's some of the things that happen when we're thinking about ethics and we try to live an ethical life, right? Integrity, principles, values, honor, choice, conscience, responsibility, and being fair to our friends, family, members, neighbors, people in other parts of the earth that we may never know, we may never cross paths with, but we care about because we're all members of the same human family. What we do here with our lives, whether it's purchasing a, a piece of attire, or buying some food, or developing some serious technology that can heal people, it can help people you know, find locations, it can help people do self-driving cars and all of that, or deliver food to people's homes and all of that, has implications and has impact on people here that are involved in using that app for that particular technology. Also, people who are halfway across the world which we never see. You have to think about this stuff, in my view. So, in light of the layoffs that are happening, and, and they're happening right now as I speak, all right? We have Meta, which is the, the parent company for Facebook, which is one of the giants of what they call the Big Nine, right? The four Chinese companies and the five American companies. Facebook being one of them. Twitter, right? We all know about the story of Twitter, right? Mr. Musk, the billionaire with uh, a certain level of incompetence, you know, decides to buy the social media network, a platform that aggregates, and it was a toxic place to begin with, and he decides to lay off 50% of the employees. Why? Good, because he wants to run it the way he wants. It's his toy. But quickly, 50%, that's thousands of people, lose their jobs overnight. So, I mean, I, I'll let you be the judge of measuring that on the ethical meter. Where does it stand? So, now of course, we know about Lyft and Netflix and Salesforce. All these companies are doing massive layoffs in the name of corporate responsibility, meaning that the shareholders' interest takes precedence over the labor that actually makes this technology functional, available, and enhanced. Right. In the name of profit. And this is the problem. We live in an environment but there's so much innovation happening, there's so much excitement around it, rightfully so, that the removal of ethics has been kind of like, you know, uh, under the radar. It's gone away. And it was never taught to us in the first place, particularly to digital natives. All right. I've been to conferences, corporate settings, and all of that, and when I suggest that, well, you should have a, a particular curriculum on ethics for your employees on a regular basis, I usually get a chuckle from that suggestion, right? They think I'm joking. Right? So, oh, no, no, talk to us about some humanity stuff. You know, you know, Aristotle to this stuff. Right? That's cool. We like 
I can hear that, sorry. So, can um, you see the next slide, please? It's enough to make you scream. You guys know this thing? Raise your hand if you know that. All hands should go up. You know, Edward Wrench's painting, you know, it's so relevant today as it was when he painted it. Right? It's about our existence. It's about the anxiety of our existence. Something that all human beings go through. And we must deal with that, what the Germans call angst, the existential angst. It's an important process of human development. So next time you're bored, don't go grab your phone or your laptop and start you know, chatting away with somebody or looking at a funny video on TikTok or something. You can do that. But you got plenty of time to do it. Put it away, take advantage of that opportunity. <laughs> Think about it. Say, oh, boredom. What does it mean? Why do I feel anxious when I'm bored? What does that mean in relation to my existence in this world? I can guarantee you, if you do that at least once a day, just for a few minutes, you will see the transformation. You will literally see the transformation in your body language, in the way you think, in the way you eat, in the way you talk to other people, and a whole bunch of other behavior, types of behavior that you will display in the world. And you feel better about it. So uh, if you take anything away from my talk, think about that, that little assignment that I'm suggesting you do for yourself. So next slide. So it is important, again, let me emphasize, for us to put humanities in tech. And not think of humanities as something that is separated from any of these disciplines, whether it's science, engineering, math, high tech, computer science, chemistry, biology, or anything. You know, before we invented, and by we I'm talking about the Western world and, and the way in which we uh, classified and organized university education, all that, before we started developing these disciplines and the separating, which is disjunctive, right, and reductive. Separating math from the arts, which when you really think about it, mathematics and the arts, whether it's visual arts or hands-on, any kind of art, or playing music, particular music, they're directly connected. It's the mathematic principles that allow us to be artistic. Right? So for me, knowledge is a seamless web. And I apply that lens to the study of technology. So when people ask me, well, what do you mean by being a philosopher of technology? What does that really mean? I say, well, you know, I look at everything being part of the seamless web. There's no distinction between disciplines for me. And I think if you think deeply about it, you're all very smart people. If you weren't smart, you wouldn't be in this room. Right? The number one criteria for you to be in this conference is to be super bright. So super bright people can actually step out of their, themselves, right? You could be introspective and think about what it means to be human. So think about this idea of what if all disciplines were part of the same thing? Right? Going back to the ancient times, the Hellenistic times, the Greeks have given us the tools for thinking and rationality and all the rest of it that helps us, you know, actually put these disciplines together. They didn't think about separation of disciplines. They called philosophy physics. The idea was ask questions, be curious, be wondrous, and find out how the world operates and what does it mean for us to be part of it and all the rest. OK, next slide. So the idea is that when you do the hackathon for the next three days, think about building bridges. Right? 
think about your projects. What are they for? Are they for purpose of social justice? Are they for potentially becoming great business ventures? Okay, business ventures to benefit whom? Right? Who are you building bridges with? You want to build bridges with venture capitalists? If you want those guys that uh, is a member of the billionaire class and all that, right? And run the world because you think you're the smartest person in the room? And then isolate yourself from the world and all that? That's a good idea. But building bridges with community, building bridges with your fellow human beings, building bridges with people who work in other areas, other fields. So let's say you develop an app to help with health education. Right? Maybe develop something that can measure your vital signs and then alert you to go see your doctor if something is going on direct it to the hospital, local hospital, or your local physician, also the family members and friends, all that, right? That'd be a great app. So that's what I mean by building bridges. Connect one another. Somebody said, I said, why are you here? So to make connections, there's this gentleman right here. That's what it's about. Connections means building bridges between each other. Also going back to the original slide of the digital natives and the digital immigrants, we need to have bridges between ourselves, right? I want to walk on that bridge and meet you, and I want you to have the inclination to also walk on that bridge and come and meet me, right? The caveat that I have about building bridges is the caveat that should be applied to all human activity. The human hubris. We like to think that we're masters of the universe. We're not masters of anything. I know it's kind of deceiving when you work on these projects and you develop something and you, you, you make new things, the creativity, which is part of the human condition, all that. And when you achieve your goals, when you, when you meet the objectives of your project, at the end you think, I'm the master of the universe. You feel like the master of the universe. But you're not. The moment you think you're the master of the universe is the moment where hubris kicks in and you become an arrogant, you know what? Don't be that. Take that from me. Next slide. If there is one. Right, okay, I like to close. There's one more slide after this, but I like to close with these two slides. This is from William James. If you don't know who William James is, was, look it up. Those of you who study psychology or uh, English literature or any kind of humanities fields must be familiar with William James. What did he say? He was very interested in studying human consciousness. He said that act as if what you do makes a difference. Because it does, right? The world as you imagine it, and this is particularly relevant to the kind of, you know, hackery that you're doing here, right? if I can use that word. Uh, because you're imagining what the possibility of in your vision, you say, well, this is what's going to happen at the end of the three-day conference. We're going to have this thing, and it's going to matter, right? It's going to mean something. So your consciousness will, will develop, your brain will get wired to the point where you will act upon that vision. Next slide, please. So, Lao Tzu, does that sound familiar to anyone? A couple of hands going up, right? Taoism, the loss of Taoism, right? Finding your way, again, that's directly relevant to the work that you do in this conference. He said, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step, which could easily translate into, we are already on the journey. Every step of the journey is the journey. So think about the process. And when I say ethics, every step that you take, you must consider the ethical implications of that step, because it's part of the journey, and in fact, it is the journey. 
And I think this is the end. Is there another slide? Omar? Yes. I don't know if you have time for if people want to ask a question or make a comment or something. Or uh, what do you think? A burning question, burning commentary, a critique, a heckle of sorts, anything? Well, have a great time the next three days, and thank you for having me.